We are being lied to. We are all being lied to. All of the time. <laughs> but this is okay. Because these little lies, we, we sort of know, right? These are the little lies that are in magazines and in movies. They're in the newspapers we pick up, in the social media we subscribe to, and in the conversations we have with each other. We use these little lies to sensationalize, to make things more entertaining, to make life a little bit more interesting. But the role of science within society is changing. Science is now in the mainstream. And suddenly, every media organization seems to have a science editor. And suddenly, these little lies, they're in science, designed to sensationalize and to entertain, to make science more interesting, so that you can generate clicks on a web page, or so that you can sell newspapers with sensational headlines like ibuprofen helps you live extra 12 years. I looked into that headline. It is only true if you are yeast, <laughs> a tiny worm, or a fruit fly. <laughs> Unless told to do so by your doctor, the chances are regularly taking I ibuprofen will reduce your life expectancy. This is what happens when you sensationalize science, when you put lies into something that relies on truth, that runs on truth. That headline is at best controversial and at worst dangerous. And this brings me to my first illusion of science, the controversies. Now, I admit science will probably always be controversial, but the kind of controversies I'm talking about are not the sorts that come from relatively new discoveries like embryonic stem cell research or cloning, no. And it's also not the kinds of controversies that come from long-standing ethical debates like animal testing. No, the kind of controversies I'm talking about, they're entirely made up. Take, for instance, the anti-vaccination movement. People have been afraid of vaccines since the day they were discovered. Look, here is a cartoon published by the Anti-Vaccination Society in 1802. It shows people being deliberately infected with cowpox, a relatively harmless virus which happens to make you immune to smallpox which is one of the most deadly diseases to ever plague humanity. But people were afraid. They were afraid that being infected with cowpox would quite literally turn them into a cow. Genu genuinely, you know, it seems ridiculous now, genuinely, for someone in 1802, that was a real concern, a, a genuine concern. Now, I can't claim to have looked into this very much, but, I'm fairly certain <laughs> that no one turned into a cow. But what did happen was in 1979, we eradicated smallpox from the face of this planet by vaccinating our population. Now, smallpox only exists in laboratories and millions of lives are saved literally every year. Society had the anti-vaccine conversation back in 1802, and yet somehow it came back. And like some sad and distant echo of a 200-year-old scientist, I find myself talking to parents, trying to convince them that vaccinations will not harm their children, and that measles, mumps, and rubella can cause death. How? How did this happen again? It's what happens when you begin to put illusions in science. Science has bad PR. It's always going to. Because scientists are not in the business of selling truth. They're in the business of discovering it. And even scientists, it seems, are not immune to the effects of these little lies. And this brings me to my next illusion of science, the scientist. See, a lot of people have this great idea of the genius scientist off in a lab somewhere discovering one thing after another. It is an idea we are very quick to extend a lot of credibility to, to a single person who claims to be an expert. You're all doing it for me. <laughs> right now, in fact. But really, the scientist is the smallest component of science, a tiny part of a much larger institution. You see, science is better thought of as an ongoing conversation, a shifting debate between thousands and thousands of scientists. It is a consensus. 
It is not one person's idea. I'm not even sure it's fair to call it an idea. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than a single scientist. But the problem can often come when a single scientist announces a discovery, because if that discovery has a bit of a story behind it, the media is quick to cover it. And that coverage often presents a very unrepresentative view of what people really think. The climate change debate is an excellent example of this. The debate always looks like this, with one person arguing that man-made climate change is happening and one person arguing that it's not. But this gives a very polarised and evenly weighted view of the argument. The truth is, if you ask 100 climate change scientists whether they think man-made climate change is happening, about 97 will say yes, and three will say no. And what that means is a, a that, what that means is a conversation that's shown to you to look like this really looks like this. This is what happens when you put illusions into science. And even as a scientist, it is very hard to really know what the current consensus is, because it's, it's always moving. And in this sense, it's important to always remain sceptical of things you hear that, you don't, you know, that don't seem right to you. Critical thinking is not something that is reserved for scientists. It's an ability we all have. But, and this is very important, if you want to be sceptical, more than anything, be sceptical of yourself. Because science is going to tell us things that are uncomfortable, things that go against what we think or believe, things that are deeply troubling. And we have this tendency to quickly believe things that seem right to us and disagree with things that don't. It's called confirmation bias. And I think, again, climate change, global warming suffered greatly from this. Science told us that we were selfish, that we're destroying the planet we live on, that we're unsustainable. And that is not a message many people like. If I am honest, I would prefer it wasn't true, but it is true. Climate change is happening, and we have to face that fact, however uncomfortable it may be. Not every idea worth spreading can have a happy, a happy ending or a feel-good message. Not every idea can be sexy. And this brings me to my next illusion of science, sex sells. Now, many of us are familiar with this idea in magazines and in movies. We know that models are photoshopped and that Hollywood is ridiculous. But suddenly, sexy is in science. <laughs> now, to really explain what I mean by this, I'm going to give you an example. Some of you may have recently seen a story like this in, in the news, or maybe this one, or in fact this one, this one, <coughs> this one, or this one, and, and many others. All of them relate to this. It's called the Skylon <coughs> Project, and it's best described as a rocket plane. Now, rocket planes are a great way of getting to space. The biggest issue with making one is, is building an engine. And that's where all these stories come in, because as it turns out, they built the engine. But to really explain why that matters, you need a little context. And it's the context that these stories lack. It's the context that you need. And that's why I have chosen this example, because I know something about rockets. And what I know about rockets is that they are rubbish. <laughs> they are a terrible way of getting to space. A rocket weighs a thousand tons. It takes ten tons to orbit. That's one percent. If a rocket was a car, you couldn't even put a single person in it. And getting those ten tons to orbit costs 150 million, fifty million dollars. What makes it worse is that you then crash most of that rocket back into the planet on your way up, right? Imagine if every time you got on a plane, you had to pay for the entire cost of the aircraft. Ticket prices would go up. <laughs> As it happens, the ticket price of going to orbit is about $1.5 million ahead. The Skylon project can do that for 65000 It is over 20 times cheaper. That means for every rocket you launch, the Skylon project launches 20. Imagine if there was not one International Space Station, but 20. Not one Mars rover, but 20. Or to put it another way, everyone who can currently afford a sports car can now afford to go to orbit. Yet all of these stories choose the same angle. Britain to Australia in four hours with new engine. Yes, it's sexy, but it misses the point. Imagine, imagine for a second, it is now 1903. The only way to fly in 1903 is in a balloon, or in this glider. 
And then you get the headline, Wright Brothers Invent Powered Flight. But you don't get that headline. You get, now possible to get to shops in 30 seconds. <laughs> that headline is ridiculous because we know how aviation, how flying changed society. Look, 1903, Wright Brothers first powered flight. 100 years later, just 100 years, 2003, about 2 billion passengers and 40 million tonnes of cargo are moved in that one year alone. Or another way, 1903, Wright Brothers' first flight. 110 years later, Voyager 1 leaves the solar system. Think on that. 110 years after we worked out how to get off of the floor, we left the solar system. And you're telling me the most interesting part of this story is that we can get to Australia in four hours? No, not even close. We are potentially ushering in a whole new era of human existence. This, this is what happens when you put illusions in science, when you make science sexy. To quote a popular internet cartoon, you don't love science, you're looking at its butt when it walks by. <laughs> but don't, don't get me wrong, I really do enjoy seeing so much science in the media. Because what that means is that us, society, we really care about science and what's happening. But we are buying into these illusions. And just like photoshopping models creates a distorted body image, it does the same for science. And you can argue that scientists need to do a better job communicating their science. And you can argue that newspapers need to do a better job of factually reporting it. But ultimately, it's us, society. We have to stop buying into these illusions. And modern society has gotten really, really good at creating this glittery light show around everything. But if you take away the lights and the illusion, you're left with something more. Because science isn't sexy. Science is beautiful. And that beauty is hope, the hope of a future. Because if we just sit here on this planet, doing the things we already do, enjoying these illusions, getting places a little bit quicker, living a little bit longer, then we know how humanity's journey ends. And it will end here, on this planet. But if we do more than simply survive, if we give up on these illusions, if we discover, if we explore, if we expand, then humanity's future is uncertain. Science is proof that humanity was not content to simply exist on some tiny rock in the outer spiral arm of the Milky Way. To me, it means that we refused to fade into the darkness, that we raged against the dying of the light. Who knows if we make it? Who cares? We tried. Thank you.